there's two big reasons why women reach out to me. And the first one is this belief that the way they eat is their fault. And it is a huge issue. You know, they'll say to me, well, I'm the one that buys the food. I'm the one that prepares the food. I'm the one that eats it, <laughs> you know? So therefore it is my fault, you know, like it, it's, it's like that. And, and, but the problem is that belief that it is our fault is not at all helpful. In fact, it tends to trigger us to eat more and to eat foods that are high in fat and high in sugar. It just perpetuates that belief that it's our fault. Hey there, I'm Amy Connell. Welcome to Graced Health, the podcast for women who want simple and grace-filled ways to take care of themselves and enjoy a little chocolate in the process. I'm a certified personal trainer and nutrition coach who wants you to know your eating, movement, and body don't have to be perfect. You just need to be able to do what you're called to do. I hear you. On what, you ask? <laughs> On the struggle and challenge with food and eating and all that goes into it, whether it is through Instagram, where I receive DMs or comments on Facebook, uh, personal conversations, or even the survey that I send out to people who join my email list, I keep getting the message that food is a real challenge. Let's be honest. Food and eating and qualities and what and when and all the things are challenging. They are confusing, sometimes contradicting each other, which just adds to that challenging and confusing element. There's just a lot of voices. There's a lot of people saying, do this, don't do this. You should be doing this. I mean, it's just, it's so much. And then on top of all of that, there is another element layered over it uh, that that kind of surrounds the emotions we have with our food and uh, and how we may tr- eat or consume food differently when we are having different emotions. And then, of course, sometimes that can lead to guilt and shame. Uh, but other times that can lead to a smile our, on our face and just kind of make us smile remembering a, a particular moment that we really enjoyed. And, and of course, that's so, there's so much more to that. My guest today, dietitian Sally Ann Pisk, is here in the most gentle and peaceful and grace giving way uh, to really help us navigate those emotions and how they relate to our food. I just feel my shoulders relaxing when I speak with her. I noticed it when I uh, when we had the interview and then there was a little bit of a gap in time from when I had the interview to when I actually edited it. And I could just feel the same thing over and over. And I think you're going to feel relaxed as well and just maybe have a deeper understanding of how we can navigate our emotions surrounding our food. And it's not all bad. It's not all bad. And I really appreciate, um, her teaching me that. She has just such a tender way of bringing awareness to our emotions associated with our eating um, and then what to do with that as well. Because sometimes I know I can't speak for you, but I can speak for myself that I will notice that I am feeling maybe either out of control or I'm feeling anxious or stressed. And I can feel myself in a state of like, what I really want to do is eat the entire bag of ruffles but I'm not going to. So uh, Sally Ann is just um, such a, I just keep using the word gentle because I think that that's the best way to describe her. And isn't that who you want on your, on your side, on your team is, is a gentle, gentle leader. Let me tell you really quickly about Sally Ann. She has worked in health for 30 years as a practitioner, researcher, and manager. She is an accredited practicing dietitian in Australia and a mindfulness practitioner and author. For the last 10 years, she has been devoted to helping women transform their eating mindset and relationship with food. And speaking of changing mindsets. I want to remind you of my book, Your Worthy Body, Find Freedom and Health by Breaking All of the Rules, which is a total mindset shift about not only our food, but also our body, our 
fitness and why we even take care of ourselves in the first place, which spoiler alert, it's not so we can have six pack abs. If you have not gotten your copy, I really would love to get that in your hands. Simply just go to the link in the show notes and you can go grab that. It is available in print ebook and very, very soon will be available in audiobook. So if you like to listen to your books, it's coming. I promise it's coming and you will know. Okay, let's bring on Sally Ann. Sally Ann, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. I am really excited for this conversation. I always had this vision of emotional eating, and I know we're going to talk a lot about emotional eating today, but I always had this vision of like in the pantry with the Oreos, boo-hooing, tears, you know, falling onto whatever the, you know, the fake the cookie or whatever that was. And what I am learning is it is so much more complicated than that. And the mind body connection is so much stronger and that it's, it's just more than the, you know, the crying and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So I'm really excited to dig into this today. What I have found though, in talking with people sometimes is often there's a story behind the passion of what we do. And I was wondering if you might be able to share some about what you do, but then also what led you to, uh, to do what you do. Yeah, certainly. Um, it's probably easier to begin, uh, close to the beginning. Um, and that will explain, uh, why, why I do what I do. And like a lot of women, um, my relationship with food became unsettled, uh, probably in my teenage years. And I summarise it this way in many ways with a question, why did I ever go on a diet? Where, you know, why did I have these rules? But over time I've realised that it's our relationship with food much before uh, our freedom to choose what food we eat ourselves. It comes from the food rules in the family as well, which, you know, we'll touch on during the conversation. And so I can recall sitting with my girlfriends at high school, secondary college, going through all the diets, all the fashion magazines, and it was just perpetuated. And, of course, these days we've got social media as well, you know, adding into all of that. So um, there's all this external stuff happening as well as any internal processing that might be going on about food. And I decided to go off to university. I could have, you know, I started with, you know, my science degree and thought, oh, well, will I do nutrition like I'd planned to? Would I do exercise, you know, science or psychology interest me as well? So it was all of those things uh, that come together to support our health. Um, I'm glad I chose nutrition. Um, I, I definitely am. And as I worked, you know, in my 20s, I realized that this relationship we have with food is really important. Um, Unfortunately, as I said, for many of us, it is destructive rather than a source of nourishment for us. When my brother died suddenly, um, when I was in my mid-20s, I flipped because, you know, before I'd been a restrictive eater in the sake of health, uh, probably some body image issues there as well. But then when he died suddenly, I developed a comfort eating habit. And it was actually when this occurred and I was trying to work my way through this that I realized beforehand I'd been really restrictive, you know, and it wasn't until I saw the total opposite, I realized where I had come from. And it was through a conversation with a girlfriend who is also a dietitian, you know, she suggested, you know, I looked at my relationship with food and started, you know, thinking about food, uh, not just from a purely nutritional point of view but just to let go of some of those rules. And that was both liberating and terrifying at the same time because it was like, well, if I don't have those rules, where am I going to end up? And, yeah, it was a journey that continued probably for the next 10 years or so. I didn't realise at the time, but that was actually the start of Eating For You. And when I started writing my book, um, it wasn't about mindful eating and living. Uh, It was 
just working out our relationship with food really and making sense of both the nutrition side of food but also these eating habits that we often find challenging. You know, the the working title of my book was Know Yourself, Know Your Food, but there was something missing. You know, there, there needed to be a third thing. And then, of course, that became the third pillar of eating for you, which is to uh, know how to introduce and live with change because I had realised at this stage I was probably 10, 15 years into my career that it doesn't matter how much nutrition knowledge you have. Hey, I, I had been through that myself. You know, it was I had the knowledge but it just wasn't coming together. It wasn't making sense for me um, at all. And yeah, so that that are, they are the three pillars of eating for you. It's about knowing yourself, knowing what uh, nourishes you really. You know, it's about knowing food, but also what else nourishes you, and knowing how to introduce and live with change. Oh my gosh, that is so. I have never um, thought about it from those three perspectives, and I think you're right that introducing. Um, and, and living with change because we all have it. And I think the default for a lot of us is, is to go to food to either comfort us or bring stability or have control. And I'm sure we'll get into all of that. (laughs) And I also want to go back to relationship with your friends. I mean, we do, so many of us have food rules and I know as a mom and as someone who's aware, like I recognize sometimes my own madness and, you know, not creating like you can have this and you can't have that, but I get focused on, I'm like, look, boys, you guys are athletes. And if you want to perform well, then this is what you should have. And I recognize like my own, one of my only challenges is I get a little too focused on that, but we, we have such a toxic relationship sometimes when we combine our friendships whom we love and are wonderful. I'm not saying those relationships are, are, are toxic, but there seems to be something that bonds women together when we either talk about our body in negative ways, or we talk about food that we should or shouldn't be eating. It's like the common denominator for many, many women. And I, I, what I love Sally Ann is I'm sitting here in Texas and you are over in Australia and we are both, we both have that same type of story. And I know women between here and there do as well. (laughs) So this is like a universal issue. Oh gosh. (laughs) Um, Okay. So let's dig into, uh, into emotional eating some, because I know that this is a passion of yours and helping women understand, um, understand emotional eating, understand triggers. Is there like a, um, a formal definition of emotional eating? Cause I don't think it is crying in the pantry with Oreos. Like I, I think, I don't think that that's it. There's probably more to it than that. Yeah, look, it's, it's a great question. Um, and at the end of the day, I think we are all, uh, you know, emotions are, are quite a subjective thing in terms of how mm-hmm. we experience them. And we know, you know, they come from our, you know, thoughts and beliefs and all of that's tied up in there as well. And when we talk about trying to understand where emotional eating fits in, you know, some people will contact me and say, you know, well, I have a binge eating problem. Um, well, that means something different to everyone as well. And of course, we do have a, a diagnosis for binge eating disorder. And With emotional eating, we also have that issue of uh, stress eating or comfort eating. Uh, It could be boredom eating. And and it's really interesting because I don't think um, I myself and a lot of other ladies don't think about boredom as being an emotion as well. We just think it's a sort of state of mind. You know, it's just, you know, we're bored. Um, But it actually has uh, underlying, you know, roots and emotions as well. I I kind of work along the spectrum of, well, is your eating related to being physically hungry or not? You know, that's sort of the starting point to try and work out what these drivers are for eating. And then we work out, well, you know, there can be lots of reasons why we eat, you know, in in terms of, you know, rather than hunger. Uh, And in the eating for you approach, I have sort of teased out nine of them of which, you know, physical hunger is only one. Uh, You know, we make choices around food because of our health. We make choices around food because of our body image, you know, and, and weight issues. We make choices around 
our ethical and cultural and religious beliefs, uh, they're a driver for eating as well. They have they put a filter over the top as well in terms of what we eat. Of course, we eat for, you know, based on our knowledge and skills of nutrition. We do our best, you know, if we're wanting to be healthy, we, we do our best with what we have. But then there comes, you know, preferences and pleasure and emotions, as we spoke about, and convenience. And, you know, my my job working with ladies is to bring all those different drivers for eating to align them so Yes, you can enjoy food. Yes, it can be convenient. Yes, it can be nourishing, you know, in terms of supporting your health. And it can also be in align with your, you know, spiritual, cultural, ethical beliefs as well. Yeah, so I, I don't like to work with the definition. I just like to see what is really driving um, people's, you know, reasons for eating, what's behind it. Uh, and, and that's where the, you uh, know, emotional eating triggers checklist came about as well from these conversations looking at some of those mindsets around food and how that can uh, you know trigger an emotional eating response as well you talk about triggers some um, and I know you have a a complete a comprehensive checklist available on your site but I was wondering if you could share some of those triggers because you know what I'm learning is Sometimes we just don't know what we don't know. One of the greatest things about doing this podcast is I get to talk with all of these amazing people and I learn and then I can I can respond and apply to myself um in in however that may be. So yeah. you know, share with us some of the triggers or maybe the most common triggers or maybe some that might surprise people um if you if you don't mind sharing a few of those because I think that that might really help my community get a brighter Um, appreciation for uh, emotional eating yeah and these these probably may not be what you're expecting either and the one of the big things um well there's two big reasons why women reach out to me and the first one is is this belief that the way they eat is their fault okay Mm -hmm. yeah and it is a huge issue. They they totally believe it. And, you know, they'll say to me, well, I'm the one that buys the food. I'm the one that prepares the food. I'm the one that eats it, <laughs> you know. So, therefore, it is my fault, you know, like it, it's it's like that. And, and But the problem is that belief that it is our fault is not at all helpful. In fact, it tends to trigger us uh, to eat more and to eat foods that are high in fat and high in sugar. And it just perpetuates that belief that it's our fault. I sort of share the scenario in terms of, well, how our eating came about. You know, in in fact, our relationship with food started before we were even born. You know, we were fed in utero by our mum, you know. So we didn't really have any say over what she was eating at that time. It's not her fault either that she was eating the way she was. She was doing the best she could uh, with the knowledge and experience that she had. And then certainly, you know, we progress on to, you know, breast milk or, you know, bottle formula, and then we are introduced solid foods. Now, I don't remember much about that process. I don't know if you do or any of your listeners do. You know, I was only six months old. Um, But I do remember that I didn't like the texture of broccoli. I remember that much. And then we do eat what's given to us, you know, in in the family. We don't have a lot of say over what our food is uh, back then. And then we touched on this before about different food rules that come into play and that is about for me it was everything was plated for us um you know mum served all the food out onto our individual plates and we had to eat everything that was on that plate you know and and now I think about it and you know I joke with my mum about it it's like well how did you ever know how much I needed to eat and she said well I didn't (laughs) yeah (laughs) And and then it was like but you made me eat it anyway. <laughs> you, know, like, um, you know, so so this is where we start exploring this. And 
you know, part of the eating for you approach is actually dismantling some of these false beliefs that we have because we hang on to them dearly, you know, and I get out, you know, what I call the knuckle busters and saying, let's just break them down because they're not serving you. You know, if there's a belief there that is no longer serving you, it's not a source of nourishment for you, then get rid of it. Just let it go. Um, But you have to go through that process of going back and, understanding why it was there in the first place and understanding why it no longer works and, you know, putting in place an alternative, which is really important, you know. So just, you know, following on to, you know, my earlier introduction about my relationship with food. So as a 10-year-old, I had learned to overeat because I had to eat everything on my plate. The other rule in our family was we couldn't have dessert unless we ate all of our main meal, our meat and vegetables. And so the good foods became the sweet foods. Our family, at least, most of the desserts were homemade, at least. They weren't, we didn't have all the packaged food that's available now. And then I'd overheard a conversation, you know, well, we do, about body weight and thinness and so forth. So I had this concept that, well, again, I hadn't processed this, obviously, as a 10-year-old, that that you have to, you know, I'd learned to overeat. The good foods were the sweet foods. And there's there's something out there about being thin is good. And so you sit there and you think, well, there's a lot of contradictions there. (laughs) You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, Mm -hmm. what does that really mean? (laughs) Um, And that was nobody's fault. Nobody set that up. But, you know, we, as children, we extract different messages and uh, we assume things. We don't necessarily question everything. So it's really interesting that, you know, when you start challenging yourself about, well, it's all my fault. Well, it's not. It doesn't mean you can't change and it doesn't mean you can't take control of your eating in a positive way, in a mindful way, in a nourishing way, in an enjoyable way, in a sustainable way. That is all possible. But sitting with that concept or belief that it's all my fault is not helpful. You know, so that is, you know, one of the triggers uh, that I mentioned in the eating checklist. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's really interesting. You know, it's funny too, that goes right in line with um, something that another guest shared with me about um, how binge eating for her was her body's way of protecting her from dealing with some pretty severe trauma that she had. So it's interesting that you shared at the very beginning that you were talking about maybe going exercise physiology or, you know, nutrition or psychology, because these are so much more intertwined than we realize, or at least that I ever realized. And I'm learning how important all of that is. But yeah, and it is. And sometimes it's your body's way of of protecting you or of, of dealing with something or, yeah, I mean, like there's, there are so many different layers of that. Yeah. So that's, um, that is, that's really interesting to me. Now you talked about the process of taking control. And I know that this is something that you work with on your clients, but can you share more about that? Like what would that look like? In in the approach, I first of all build on the uh, you know, the fundamental principle of mindfulness, which is being present, being aware. But along with that is the lack of judgment, curiosity, and uh, being open to self-compassion and understanding why you're eating in the first place because mindfulness is about purpose as well. And often uh, we think about mindfulness as being present and being aware, but those other parts of the practice of mindfulness are really important as well. And so It depends where a lady is on her journey with food, but often the first thing is eating without distraction, just Mm. making eating an occasion. That allows you to build the awareness of why you're eating in the first place. It also, uh, my approach looks at eating as starting from the time you first feel like eating to checking in afterwards as well in terms of how well you've nourished yourself, how well you've satisfied that reason for eating. And so you get that feedback and it's amazing how quickly ladies will start saying to me, I didn't realize that I ate 
because of this reason. I didn't realize that my go-to comfort food actually doesn't taste that nice. <laughs> you know, when I pay attention, when I actually yeah. sit and eat it mindfully without distraction at a table, I don't actually like it. You know, like you know, <laughs> I used to be able to eat, you know, a whole packet of these savory biscuits, mm-hmm. for example, you know, spicy, savory, uh, they're called savory shapes. You probably have something similar in America, but, and she said, you know, I, I, you know, when I really pay attention, I actually don't like them. And yet that had been her go-to comfort food for, for many, time, many years. So it's really, I outline the pathway for ladies to just observe what they're doing and understand why they do it and work out what works for them and what doesn't work for them. And as we go along, these different drivers that I meant before, you know, pop up. Ladies reach out to me because they want to stop their emotional eating. They want to stop their comfort eating. They want to take control of their eating, but without a sense of restriction. You know, it's this sense of control where you actually have total freedom to eat what you want knowing that you're not going to eat too much or too little. Um, You are going to make a mindful choice. Do you get it right all the time? No, you don't. But that's part of the feedback process in terms of uh, what you need to eat at any one time. So it really is just setting a safe pathway to go on this journey um, of observing, uh, being curious, and that's really important because when we've learned to eat with a set of rules, I'm actually, you know, putting on my scientist hat here and saying, let's do some experiments. Let's just see what happens if you eat breakfast an hour later. Let's just see what happens if you have a bigger lunch and a smaller evening meal. Let's just be curious about, you know, swapping out, you know, this food and uh, having this instead. Let's just see what happens. And that brings some of that fun and interest back into food from a different perspective. Uh, Sometimes it's not about what we eat. It's about how much we have or how we eat it as well. Um, So making food an experience, eating an experience and a nourishing experience is is definitely part of the aim. I have to imagine... um that when you, when you say, you know, it, it's, it's fun to experiment and all of that. And it is, and it's funny because that I'm such a proponent of people, of uh, people experimenting, particularly with their fitness, like, cause it's important yeah. to mix it up and it's good for you and like all of yeah. the different things. But you know what it also is, is it's really scary. And especially mm-hmm. if you have grown up with, with, family food rules or food rules that you've put on yourself or, oh, well, this food is quote good for me. And this food is quote bad for me. And what's going to happen if I do that? I mean, there's a lot of fear that goes along with saying, well, I'm just going to see what happens, <laughs> what happens. And so I, I don't know, I'm just kind of, I, as I'm listening to you, I'm like, this all makes sense. But for someone who has been living in the, in those chains for so long, it's really scary. So I'm wondering if what kind of encouragement you might give to someone who's like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know that I trust myself to yeah. experiment because I'm afraid I'm going to go off yeah. the rails. Yeah. So what what I do, and I need to let you know, sometimes ladies who join my programs are on diets of some you know description. And we talk about that and they know they're coming into an approach that is not about rules, uh, not about restriction, um, but they want to keep a layer of comfort with them. And, and, you know, through the process they start to realise when they're working more on that psychological level or that belief level uh, that these food rules are actually becoming an obstacle to them. They realise they can let them go. Um, so I don't. You know, we have a, a uh, saying here in Australia, cold turkey, where you give up everything um, at once. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's not the approach that I take with people's um, relationship with food. And the other thing that's really important is that you, I, I get the ladies just to focus on one thing at a time, one change, whether that's a belief, whether that's a food choice, whether that's a particular snacking habit. Um, And that way they can gain confidence uh, in trying this mindfulness approach and see how it works. Because once you 
start noticing what works, you gain confidence and motivation. And that is kind of one of the other uh, things on the checklist. This concept of willpower uh, can really trip us up. It's like, I've got no willpower, I may as well give up. But it's not about willpower. It's about that intrinsic motivation. And that comes from observing what we do well. And so I'm very watchful and encourage the ladies to become very mindful of how they're speaking to themselves, what they're observing about their eating. Because on our calls, for example, they can be very good at listing off all the things that went wrong or all the times that they overate or all the times that they weren't as mindful as they could have been, all the times that they, you know, forgot to do the shopping so then just to have to have a sandwich or toast or something for dinner. And I have to remind them, but what else was going on? You know, didn't you tell me that, you know, you had a day where, you know, it was quite stressful, you went to the cookie jar three times and you thought, no, this is not going to solve the problem and then went down away and sat down and, you know, read a book or rang a friend or went outside instead of, you know, seeking solace from the cookies. And so you've got to remind them of, you know, we've got to remind ourselves, not just the ladies that we work with, that we do do things that are positive in supporting our health and well-being. And it's by focusing on those things that we have the motivation and we build the confidence to keep going. If we continually just focus on the things that are not working out the way we'd like to, that deflates our motivation. And, and that's really what I sense from working with the ladies is what's happening. It's not about willpower. They're just giving themselves a hard time. They're just, you know, creating uh, this high list of things that that aren't working and forgetting to build the list of things that are working for them. I've had a lot of conversations with therapists and neuropsychologists, and they just talk about how it is so much easier for the brain to be negative those paths are well-worn and it's easier. And the more we do it, the easier it is for us to go back to that in those negative aspects. But likewise, we can create those new paths in making positive choices and recognizing those small wins. So I love that you remind us about that and having, having just those little, the, the awareness, the mindfulness, um, the reminders of the positive aspects that we're making and that it's not necessarily going to be an on and off switch and it's going to be a process and, and a journey. So yeah, thank you for that. I'm, I'm wondering if as, as my listeners are tuning into this conversation and they're thinking, you know, I might be more of an emotional eater than I thought I was. And by the way, I think I'm probably one of those, those (laughs) listeners. Um, Do you have any suggestions on how they can, um, you know, like tips and tricks or something that we could, they can just take and try and change that mindset? Or if they're recognizing that, you know, I might not be responding to this well, or I find myself that I'm going into the pantry after lunch and getting some Dove chocolate hand raised, you know, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, do you have any suggestions on, um, or like I said, tips and tricks on, on changing that and starting to apply some of these new ways of thinking and journeying with our food? Yeah. And I think, you know, working on the the basis of mindfulness, it's that awareness first. It's understanding your own patterns. It's also understanding what your triggers are. So the emotional eating triggers checklist um, identifies the the top seven things uh, or, you know, triggers that I work with, um, with ladies. And so that's a resource definitely I would... um, encourage everyone to take a look at if you sense that there is something emotional, something belief related going on uh, with your eating, then that will uh, give you a bigger insight into um, how powerful our mind is in influencing what we end up eating. And, you know, so certainly, you know, having a look at that, that's the eating checklist dot com uh, is where you can uh, find that from but it's also really um, spending a little bit of time to reflect on well where did this come from um, 
If we look at food being a sense of comfort, a sense of escape, a sense of reward, that belief has come from somewhere. And just understanding that it has an origin probably somewhere from our childhood. And I, you know, often relate to um, what we uh inadvertently you know train our children or grandchildren with and it's like you know if you're good while we go shopping or you you know you got a great mark at school or you did really well with your sports event let's go and have an ice cream now on the surface that seems like a wonderful thing to do you know let's go and have an ice cream let's go and enjoy something um uh, you know that's pleasurable But what's happening at like the brain level, like you were saying before, those neural pathway level is like when I want to reward, food is a good option. Yeah. When I feel sad, you know, like, you know, if you fell over, like that that was a classic, you know, you fall over, I'll go and get you a sweet or I'll go and get you a lolly. Like I said, on the surface, there doesn't seem to be any harm and it depends on our development in terms of what other things are we reaching out for that nourish and replenish us? You know, as adults, that could be, you know, listening to to great music, it could be going to a movie, it could be going for a walk in nature, it could be buying yourself a bunch of flowers or a pot plant, it could be, you know, having an aromatherapy bath or going for a massage. There's lots of things that nourish us. So it's thinking broadly about what is going to really nourish us and sustain us. And if in the journey, you your reflection that you identify, there was an event of trauma that perhaps is related to your overeating, comfort, stress, emotional eating habit, then I would really encourage you to get some support to work through that that trauma as well, you know, professional support. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Okay. So I'm thinking of a scenario that I happens with me, but I know I'm not alone in this. So I make almost all my meals at home and I'm, you know, thoughtful and I plan and, you know, all the things. And then there are times that I, you know, we'll go out to dinner. Right. And so the mindset, and I'm fully aware of this. And when you talk about the things that we are inadvertently passing on to our children, I'm, I, I'm 100% positive and aware that this is happening. And I, and I I feel like I'm watching like a a snowball roll down the hill and I don't know how to stop it. But you, you were like, all right, we're going to go out and get Mexican food tonight. And so it's whether or not it actually is, it's like a celebratory event because we're not Mm -hmm. eating at home because we're not, because I didn't have to cook and Mm -hmm. my, my family doesn't have to clean. And so we're, you know, we're out and then it's like, well, I hardly ever go out to eat. So I'm going to enjoy all the chips and salsa and guacamole that I want. And you know what? I'm kind of full with these fajitas, but I don't get to go out to eat very much. So I'm going to eat as much as I want. And I know in my head, this is an issue how can we pull ourselves out of that, out of this justification almost of, well, this, you know, I just don't go out to dinner very often. And so I'm just going to enjoy it to its fullest extent. (laughs) And I think it's actually what you said at the end. It's the enjoyment and it's re-looking at what enjoyment really means. And so Does it mean that sometimes we overeat? It might mean that. But if we eat too much, you know, and we go past that point of pleasure, then that's no longer enjoyment. So it's looking at redefining what enjoyment actually means to us. You know, part of the mindfulness approach is very much about, um, well, one or two squares of chocolate might be pleasurable and might be nourishing, but the whole block isn't. And so it's working out, well, where's my off button or where's that that tipping point from where my eating experience goes from something that's exciting, enjoyable, pleasurable to, oh, my goodness, I've eaten too much. And and what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about necessarily the guilt that we may feel. It might be 
also that, you know, physical discomfort, you know, for people who have right. um, lifestyle conditions that might be blood sugar levels, you know, are out of whack. Um, so it's about, well, what is the impact of moving from an amount of food that's nourishing to something that is, oh my goodness, I've eaten too much. What what does that really mean to us? And is it a problem or isn't it a problem? Um, so, you know, that that's it. You know, if we, we look back again at cultures, there there have been feasts where people um, ate more food than they normally would, but it's about at what stage is that no longer pleasurable for you? Yeah. That's good. That make that does make sense. Thank you for that. And I don't feel qu- quite as bad <laughs> now. <laughs> okay. Um, I like to <laughs> um, I like to finish up asking a couple questions of my guests. Um, one of them is I am fascinated by tattoos. Uh, I don't have any, but I have found that oftentimes people will have a story behind a tattoos if they have one. So I was wondering if you had any tattoos, if you would be willing to share uh, one, if you have one and what it means. And if you didn't, if you don't have one, if you had to get one, what would it be and where would it go? I love this question. I think tattoos are something that I've had different thoughts about, you know, o- over my, my lifetime. And um, when I was younger, I probably thought, yeah, I'd get a tattoo. Um, and it, you know, looking back, I probably would have gone for something like a unicorn or a horse. I have horses, you know, and I've had them um, for a long time in my life. So, you know, like a galloping horse may have been something that I would have gone for. But it would have been small. And, you know, I've had friends who've had tattoos done and, you know, they've done their ankle or they've done, you know, their wrist. I never got to the stage of actually ever seriously thinking about getting a tattoo because, I thought, well, it's going to hurt, you know, and there was a stage where it was quite infectious, you know, there were were problems in the industry in Australia in terms of, um, you know, hygiene practices and health practices. That's obviously not a problem anymore. But, no, I've never done it, Um, but it would have been possibly a horse, possibly a love heart. You know, I'm very basic when it comes (laughs) to life. You know, it's like love is is something that we can all have more of. Um, Yeah, so... Yeah, that's, that's my only thoughts. Uh, my husband has now gotten really used to me just asking like random people who are, you know, waiting on us at, at, the, at the Mexican restaurants <laughs> or anywhere else. Just, yeah. And I'm like, oh, I like your tattoo. Tell me about it. So he's very patient with that about it. But I have, I definitely love to ask those, that question now. <laughs> and then one on, um, on a little more serious note, I was wondering if you had a meaningful Bible verse that you would like to share. <laughs> Yes. Um, in preparing um, for our conversation today, I thought, what is it really about? You know, uh, you know, we started our conversation on this, you know, how did I end up doing what I do? You know, it was partly for my own journey, but it was also partly um, to help others, uh, you know, not struggle with food and enjoy food and yeah, let it just be what it's supposed to be, a source of nourishment rather than a total Uh, occupation of our mind and so it's very much about love and I've realized that the one of the biggest other issues um, or barriers that ladies often have in investing in their health and really renewing their relationship with food is about giving self-care and self-love to themselves and um, what I'm going to share is kind of interesting how this popped up today because it's also my wedding anniversary uh, on this day that we're we're doing our recording. So um, it's 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonour others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of right or wrong. Sorry, that is just wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. 
And it's interesting that we often think about love in terms of our relationships with others. Um, But our relationship with food can definitely be a source of love for ourselves and nourishment for ourselves. And there were a few things in there that I thought was really important because one of the principles that I use in working with my ladies is, is being patient and kind to yourself. Um, so that aligns very much with this scripture. It doesn't dishonor others. And so No, it doesn't matter what food rules we've followed in the past or what diets we have tried or what programs, you know, we have tried. We don't have to be regretful or think that they have failed us. We just just let them go, you know, and we find our own way. Um, and, And as we talked about before, it's about not keeping the record of wrongs and, so often that is what we do in our relationship with food is that we're looking at all the things that we're doing wrong, whereas we need to be looking at the ways in which we are actually nourishing ourselves. And I particularly like the protection and the perseverance message as well because by nourishing ourselves, we're protecting ourselves so we can be fully who we are, enjoy our life, share our life with others, but we have to persevere as well um, and persevere to mm-hmm. find a way of eating that really nourishes us. And what I love is, I mean, if you have ever been to a wedding more than one, I mean, you've probably heard that. But what I love about scripture is that we can take it and it can speak to us in so many different ways. And I that's so applicable uh, with our conversation. And so I just love that insight that you gave with it. And um, it's it's wonderful and happy anniversary too, by the way. <laughs> thank <you. laughs> so, um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Sally Ann, tell people how um, they can connect with you and where to go to get the, um, the triggers download and all of that kind of good yes. stuff. Yes. Okay. So the emotional eating triggers checklist has its own website. So it's easy to find it's eating All of the other resources for Eating For You are on the Eating For You website, which is eatingforyou.com.au. So in full words, eatingforyou.com.au. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much. I'm really glad that you can come on and have this conversation. And I I love it when I have conversations that encourage me to grow, to reflect, to be aware, to be mindful of whatever it is. My community knows that I will be the first to say that, um, you know, eating can be more of a challenge to me. I got the exercise thing down. That's not a problem. I love it. But the eating can be definitely a challenge. So I look forward to applying to some of this and to checking out your triggers checklist, check triggers checklist, say that fast five times. <laughs> and, um, and I just really appreciate your wisdom with all of this. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I've had a wonderful time. Thank you. The more I learn about our body and mind, the more convinced I am that our overeating or disengagement from eating is so much deeper than simply deciding or not deciding to eat something. If this conversation rang a bell for you, I really encourage you to check out Sally Ann's eating checklist on Uh, or just go to her site. I do have both of those in the show notes, uh, so you can grab them there. Now, if this was a valuable way to spend your hour, or if you're like me, more like a 40 minutes because you listen on 1.5 speed, I would really appreciate it if you would do one of three things that are very valuable to me. Number one, rate and review this podcast, which I know can be a little confusing, particularly on Apple, which is why I have a link in the show notes to just really simply click on it, go there and leave that review. So thank you for those or thank you to those of you who have been doing that. Number two, sign up to receive my free monthly journals. This is a subscriber only space for me to share things I love and think you will too. So I I create all of this with you in mind. Number three, purchase a copy of my book, Your Worthy Body. Again, this is not a diet book. This is not a how-to. It is a cross-cultural, grace-filled look at how we change our mindset about our body, eating and movement, and it's all done through a lens of faith. 
Each episode, I try to leave you with one simple thing I want you to remember because we cover a lot of ground and let's just make it simple. Our emotions can drive what we eat and how much we eat, but this is what I really loved that I learned today. Not all of those are bad. One of the greatest things you can do is bring awareness to those emotions and just notice them. That's a great first step in healing what needs to be healed and also appreciating the positive emotions you may have as well. Okay, that is all for today. Go out there and have a graced day. Mm -hmm.